It's good to have our visitors tonight. Glad that you have taken time to be with us. It's good to see everyone. All of us are, I think, uh, sniffling a little bit and, and uh, have a difficulty singing, talking, uh, or ha having a little bit of stuff going around. So we need to be uh, praying for one another. <clears throat> My lessons this morning were very short, and this one might be very short. I feel better than I sound. I feel okay, but my voice is, is uh, giving me trouble once again. <clears throat> Hopefully we can get that cleared up pretty quick. One of the most fascinating studies that I think that is sometimes neglected in the Lord's church is the concept of God. The concept that there is but one God, yet the Bible teaches that he exists in three persons. And I think this is uh, something that, as I said, is neglected. You see articles written about it from time to time. You might see a book or two written about it, but really you don't hear it preached about or talked about much. And I think when we get into the Word of God, we see this as a prominent doctrine, not only of the New Testament, but of the entire Bible, as we will see from our lesson tonight. So this will be our subject, one God in three persons. The Bible talks about a divine nature. In Acts chapter 17, you have Paul preaching on Mars Hill. He's preaching to those who are the philosophers, those who are the experts of wisdom in their day. You remember when he was in the city there in Acts chapter 17 that he looked around and he saw that the city was totally given over to idols. Everywhere there was an idol. It was said by some of the ancient writers that it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was to find a person. They had all of these gods and then they had an altar to the unknown god. And then the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul took opportunity to preach to them concerning this unknown God that they were worshiping in ignorance. And he uses a term that's called the divine nature. Acts 17 and verse 29. Therefore, as he is preaching, he says, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shapen by art and man's devising. In other words, God is not served and not worshipped in idolatry. God has always condemned idolatry in the Old Testament and in the New. We cannot form an image of God or an image of what we think God is like and worship that. We must worship and serve God as he is truly revealed in his word. And this word here in the Old English is the word Godhead. It's divine nature or divinity. There is but one God or one divine nature. We find this word again in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. As Paul is talking again about the Gentiles, and he says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and divine nature. So that they are without excuse. Divine nature. In the old English it's Godhead. His eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen in creation. There is no excuse for anyone to be an unbeliever. No excuse for anyone to look around at the creation and say there is no God. Even if they didn't have a Bible and they did not know the scriptures. They can come to the logical reasonable conclusion there must be a creator of the heavens and the earth. And his divine nature is seen in creation. We see it once again, this same word in relationship to Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. As Paul is writing to the brethren at Colossae, and he says, For in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the divine nature bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ. The point that Paul is making in this verse is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had all the attributes of being divine. He did not lack one. 
all the fullness of what it meant to be God was in him bodily. So when he walked the earth, he was not only human like us in every way, but he was God in every single way. Humble, humble and submitting to the Father, but yet still he possessed the divine nature. Let's look at this uh, chart, and I think this chart, and I hope you can see it, illustrates the concept of one God in three persons. And this is based upon a very ancient chart that is found in uh, some books. The fact that there is one divine nature, there is one God, yet there are three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that share this same nature. One God, but three persons. The Son is distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is distinct from the Son and the Father. The Father is distinct from the Son and the Spirit. They're not the same person, but they are the same God. And it was the Son who was born of a virgin. It was the Son who walked the streets of Galilee and of Jerusalem. It was the Son who went to the cross and shed his blood. Not the Father, not the Holy Spirit, but it was the Son that did that. The Word that was with God, the Word that was God, John 1 and verse 1, that Word that was with God and was God became flesh, John 1 and verse 14. And therefore, the Son went to the cross, and he died on the cross. He sent the Holy Spirit when he ascended back to the Father. And the Holy Spirit inspired men to write. And therefore, they wrote Scripture. They wrote the sacred writings that we have. We have them in the Old Testament, of, of course, the 39 of the Old, and then the uh, 27 of the New, 66 books, the Word of God. And from Luke 18, <clears throat> verse 11, we learn that the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. God's word is what produces the church of Christ. Wherever this word is believed, wherever it is taught, and people believe and obey it and submit to it, there you have the church of Christ. And it is God the Holy Spirit who indwells the church, leads, guides, empowers, and strengthens the church through the word. Not in some direct manner. Not through intuition. Not in the emotions. Not in some better felt than told experience. But through the written word. This is God's power to save. Romans 1 and verse 16. So we see that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, exists as three persons. Now, <clears throat> Let us go uh, throughout the scriptures, and this is going to be a very condensed and brief study of this subject, and we're going to see this, and we can see this on the very first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Hebrew word for God there is Elohim, and it's in the plural form. One God, one Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. When we get down to the creation of man, in Genesis 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So you see, the one God said, let us do this. Let's create man in our image, in our likeness. One God, and oftentimes you would find a singular pronoun to describe him, like he did this. But then you find the plural pronouns to describe him, us and our. Therefore, you see the unity and the plurality of God in Genesis chapter 1. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. <clears throat> this was the great confession of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it goes on to say, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. 
So here we find the Lord our God in that word Lord, all capital letters, referring to the, the Hebrew name Yahweh, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Now some people make the mistake in thinking that just because they're referring to God as one, that means he must be one person. But that Hebrew word uh, there on the screen for one literally means united. It's a plural unity. It means one, but it means a united one. That word for one there in the Hebrew is the exact same Hebrew word that's used in Genesis chapter 2 when Adam and Eve were brought together and it says they will become one flesh. They were two distinct individuals, yet they would be one in the marriage covenant. And therefore God is one. Yes, there is one God. He is united, but yet there is a plurality of persons within the one God. A lot of passages we're skipping over, and we're just getting some of the highlights of the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 6. <clears throat> In Isaiah chapter 6, you find that God is appearing to Isaiah. He's seeing uh, God manifest himself. He's seeing the king of glory. He's seeing these uh, spiritual beings, these seraphim flying around. He realizes his own unworthiness to be in the presence of God. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of people of unclean lips. Woe is me. God purges him from his sin. And in Isaiah 6 and verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah, now cleansed of his sin, is ready to do the work of a prophet. But notice the language there. God says, the Lord says, Whom shall I send? There's the unity. Who will go for us? There's the plurality. One God, three persons. Now, it's not very well defined in the Old Testament because it was going to be further completely defined in the New Testament. So we go into the New Testament, we find the complete revelation of God concerning uh, the oneness and the plurality of God in scriptures that we're going to look at now. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Jesus is going to John to be baptized. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. So you see Jesus, the Son of God, being immersed in the Jordan River. Then the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit of God coming down upon him. Then a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Son, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father are all seen in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. One God, three persons. In the scripture reading, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, <clears throat> the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now notice, people are to be baptized into the name. Notice singular. Not names. Into the name, the singular name of. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That shows not only the unity within the Godhead of there being one singular name or authority, but because they are sharing that name or that authority, there is equality among them in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. John chapter 15. <coughs> John chapter 15 and verse 26. Jesus here is talking to his apostles. It's before he goes to the cross. 
and he's telling them that they're going to have a helper come to assist them uh, in doing the task that God has called them to do. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So you see the helper, who is the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, I'll send to you from the Father, that's God the Father, he will testify of me, that's the Son. Spirit, Son, and Father. And notice the pronoun that's being used to describe the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is never referred to as an it in the Bible. He is a he, the same as the Father and the Son. Never referred to as an it. He possesses personality the same as the Father and the Son. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14 <clears throat> As Paul ends the second epistle he writes to the uh, Christians at Corinth, he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, the love of God, that's referring to the Father, and the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Son, Father, Holy Spirit. Seen in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. <coughs> Excuse me. We see here that all three persons of the one God are involved in our salvation. All three of them are. As he writes to Christians, he says, You're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In sanctification of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, that's the Son. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So we see God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, Jesus Christ, all being involved. God the Father had the foreknowledge of it. He planned it. He sent the Son. The Son shed his blood on the cross. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, the writers of the scriptures wrote down that message and we're sanctified by that message, set apart for God's purpose. Now very briefly, <clears throat> before we wrap up our lesson, let's look at some false teachings on this subject. <coughs> false teachings on this subject of the divine nature or the one God in three persons. The mistake some people make is this. They say that one God is one person. There is one God, therefore, you, he must be one person. It's almost a me, myself, and I type of arrangement. That the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is a me, myself, and I of God. And they say, well, you could illustrate it this way. I am a father, I am a son, and I am a gospel preacher. But that's a mistake. We've seen from the scriptures that those three persons are distinct from one another. I don't go away from myself and then come back to myself. I don't pray to myself or talk to myself. And that's what you had Jesus doing. Jesus prayed to the Father in heaven. Jesus said, I'm ascending back to the Father in heaven. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you when I ascend back to heaven. So the me, myself, and I uh, concept of the one God being one person is false. The United Pentecostal Church believes this and also um, some other Pentecostal groups that are known as oneness. They believe this concept of God. The second one is the concept that only the Father is God. The Son is a created being, and the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force. This is the belief that God is only one person, and that the Son is nothing more than a very powerful angel that God created some time back in eternity. All you have to do is go to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and find out that's false, because in Hebrews chapter 1 it says very clearly 
that Jesus the Son created the angels and the angels worship him. The angels of God worship the Son. So the Son is not an angel himself. He is God. Only God receives worship. And so that is the concept of the Son not being eternal, only the Father. And that the Holy Spirit is nothing more than God's power. Kind of like on earth, electricity or gravity. Nothing personal about him. But we've already seen the personal pronouns that are attributed to the Holy Spirit. He will come in the name of Christ. He will be sent, Jesus said, using those personal pronouns to describe him. So the Holy Spirit is a person the same as the Father and the Son. And the group that <clears throat> holds to this doctrine is the Jehovah's Witness. They're the ones that hold to that concept of only the Father is God. <clears throat> Finally, the last one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three gods. This is the concept of tritheism. The belief that they are only united or only one in the sense that they agree with one another. But yet there are just three distinct gods. Well, we've seen very clearly from the scriptures that there is only one God. But one God that exists as three persons. This concept is found in Mormonism. Romney, one of the presidential hopefuls, a Mormon, his church teaches this, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct gods. In fact, they teach in Mormonism that each person, each faithful Mormon, will become a god themselves. So they believe not only in three gods of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they believe that you, you, you yourself, if you hold to their doctrine, can become a god. So it is a bizarre, uh, blasphemous uh, religion that is not taught in the scripture. There is one God that exists as three persons. The Bible teaches that the one true God exists as three distinct persons who are equal in nature, power, and knowledge. One God, three persons. We find out that Jesus, the Son, loved us. The Father loved us. And the Holy Spirit loved us enough that the Son would come into the world to suffer and die, that the Holy Spirit would be sent to help those apostles and those prophets write down the scriptures. This is the love of God for us so that we might be redeemed back to him. If there's anyone here tonight that needs to be baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be added to the church, we urge you to do so. If you have faith, you're willing to confess that faith and repent of your sins, we have water available. If you've done that and you've turned your back on the Lord, we urge you to repent and come back to him. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and